Boston and the president of the university. For those who don't, however, how would you describe yourself? Well, friendly. Uh, certainly interested in this area, and I'm glad that I am getting to know more students. Mm -hmm. uh, I walk every day from my house up to the office, and sometimes it's like the lemmings going to the sea. I mean, if you're here between <laughs> classes, you've got hundreds of students walking back and forth. I do try to smile, say hello. Had an opportunity to meet with a lot of the student groups, and uh, I found that my uh, coming here has been a very positive experience for me, and uh, I'm getting to know everybody else. How? did you decide to come to Moorhead? What were the major factors in your decision to come here? Well, I was a president at a school in South Carolina, about half the size of this institution, and I could have stayed there till retirement. I really didn't apply for this job. I was mm -hmm. sought out by a headhunter. Uh, at first said I wasn't interested, but they said, well, you know, give it a try. The more I looked into the place, the more I liked it. And finally, I got to the point where I decided that I did want to be president here. I pursued it. When you say you like the place, at the campus or the community? The had, uh, first talked to me in January, and an opportunity to look at Moorhead in January. Can't honestly say it's the place <laughs> at that point in time, but it certainly was the people, uh, and that's really what's made the difference. Uh, in all my conversations, what they wanted in a president, what mm -hmm. I wanted to do with the rest of my professional career, it was a good, just a real good match. And uh, I talked with my wife and my four children and decided that, hey, I've got one more presidency in me, why not here? And here I am. How long have you been in education and what got you into higher education? Well, I graduated college in 1962. Uh, coming from a working class family, I didn't have a great uh, number of ideas about potential careers, mm -hmm. so I, I actually went into education and I was a ninth grade math instructor. And a good friend of mine at the college called back and said, Ron, why don't you go to graduate school? You would be a natural in working in student personnel work, which is what you see as a student of students, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I said, why not? So we did, and one thing led to another, and my career is long, <laughs> over 30 years. And eventually I became an academic vice president, and eventually a college president, and now the time around a college president. What are some of the things that you really want to get accomplished in your term here? Well, I think that we're very fortunate here and that this institution has a sound foundation. Uh -huh. uh, we see the right leadership. What a lot of people want of me and what I think here is that we're going to a new millennium. Uh, you may have seen in print, I talked to a heart specialist. He's, I asked him, how long before you're obsolete? He said, seven years. Uh, if I don't go back to school, technology. Well, I think that's the true. You know, we put a student out of here and we want them to be able to compete with anybody anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so we need to look at what we do as an institution and ensure that we're in a process so that when you graduate, others graduate, that they have the self-confidence, they have the academic preparation to be able to compete with anyone. And that means we have to have a viewpoint about how we're a scholarship of our mm -hmm. institution, which role in public service, service students come in a variety of ways, such as economic development, uh, cultural expansion, whatever. You haven't been here long, but I was wondering, have you come across any problems that you've really had trouble dealing with or you found hard? Because I think people have problems. Now, we've had to ask, can they be solved? Yes, they can. You know, the obvious is that uh, we are not being funded, you know, the way we want to be funded. In budget, it's always you have money to do things. Thank you. Don't have. And uh, what I'm trying to do is to create a bottoms-up attitude with our faculty and with our students so that we do have some control over our destiny. Mm -hmm. uh, we shouldn't just throw it away and say, nobody loves us anymore, we don't have, the m have money. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense to me. So what you try to do is people together, working in administration, faculty, students, uh, being honest, being open, being realistic about the problem, and being able to solve them together. And I think problems are solvable. Eventually, we are going to have to have money because we mm -hmm. need to reward good effort and a variety of other things which are important to keep people here. But uh, I think that it's an overwhelming issue or okay. problem. We'll be right back after these messages with Dr. Eaglin. It chose to take your eyes off the road. Oh, this, is this is the next 60 minutes of your life. <laughs> Kentucky's roads can be highways or dieways. The choice is yours. Moorhead State University Homecoming 92 falls on a weekend of October 16th, 17th, and 18th. 
Some of the weekend festivities will be when the Eagle football team faces OVC rival Murray State on Saturday at 1.30. At halftime, the 92 homecoming green will be crowned. Following the game, there will be a fish fry at the Alumni Center parking lot. Other features of the weekend include a concert near AC at 9.30 presenting 1964 as the Beatles. And on Sunday at the MSU Golf Course will be an 18-hole scramble format golf tournament at 1 o'clock. Ketty Freeing's dramatization of Thomas Wolfe's novel Look Homeward Angel is MSU's latest theater production. This Appalachian story takes a serio-comical look at the family of Eugene Gant, his older brother who never broke away from home, his drunken father haunted by his failures, and his domineering mother's tenants in her boarding house create a colorful background for Eugene's discovery of love and his desire to escape to a new life beyond the mountains. Look Homeward Angel, October 15th, 16th, and 17th, come in the ring. Is here we're with Dr. Lynn, the new president of Moorhead University, and been talking about this and what's going on. Speaking with you earlier, we were talking about homing, and you have some of your schedule with me, and it was packed with everything from meeting with the alumni athletics fame or with seeing the entertaining group of the weekend. What is your favorite aspect of being a president? Is it the social aspect or is it something else? Well, I think I am always a frustrated academician in that. I served as an academic vice president for 11 years. And my, my true love is really try to make things occur within the institution that you receive better. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoy working with faculty groups at that end. Uh, I still, I don't have the time. I'd love to be in the classroom itself, but that would be a waste of, uh, because I probably couldn't do justice to the class, but also I think I should be doing other things. Obviously, any president had technically sound, understand the academy, and, and also human relations skills. I like people, and I like to be around. And, but also be able to conceptualize that whole thing so that you start a direction. I enjoy, uh, uh, I told someone I'm an equal opportunity president, I mean I've been everywhere, I've seen volleyball matches, football, tennis, I've been uh, going to a play this Thursday night, I've been to the theatrical, uh, other events, theatrical events, I'm going to hear the music, well I've been to the music, Duncan Recital Hall, mm -hmm. I think I should be seen, I should be supportive, uh, first time I've been here, it's great, I should enjoy working here, I didn't <laughs> know we had this and this is wonderful and I hope others take advantage of this. I have heard about your not yet plan. Mm -hmm. I don't really understand what mm -hmm. that is. Can you go into that a little bit more? Well, not yet really is a grading system because in care of students who, for example, if they're taking math, they don't quite master the, the ability of it or get, get all the fundamentals. So uh, instead of getting an F, they give them a not yet and let them continue. Well, I kind of took that concept. I'm a firm believer that people should take responsibility behavior. Uh -huh. And uh, in a in the context of dealing in student behavior and faculty behavior, uh, I felt that there are certain things that people, you know, come to class on time, come prepared, you know, very simplistic things we want to be successful. And I said that if we have students who are immature, that don't come to class, if they do, they're psychologically not, and they're not prepared psychologically or physically not there. Uh, if they are taking other students kind of down that path with them, as far as I'm not yet, they haven't really had the maturity to uh, truly be successful. I think the kindest thing to do a student like that is and, and when they're ready, have them come back and we'll have arms. Now in the meantime, we'll do everything we can to, to try to help them be better, uh, to be more uh, involved in what they're about, and what they're about is learning. And fun things too. But the key thing is to leave here with self-confidence and with some skill and with the ability to compete uh -huh. and get jobs and go on with their lives they're too immature to take advantage of that, then they ought to go home. It's the nicest thing I can do for them. Save them from getting five Fs and having that on the record. And then all that failure, uh -huh. I mean, that's awful to have all that fav failure. And over the 30 years, I've seen many students do that, and that's, un that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. So let's be honest with them. When they're not coming to class, if they're raising cane in the residence halls and bothering other people, or if their behavior is so you know, out of the norm that it creates problems, I think the nicest thing we can do for them send them home. So how do you weed out these students that are not yet? Oh, I can't weed them out. I think the whole academy has a responsibility. Uh -huh. Faculty know who's being prepared and not prepared. Faculty knows who's sleeping through the classes, who doesn't show up. Residence hall advisors know who, you know, where things are. Uh, I mean, uh, friends. I mean, I would hope we'd get to a point where, uh, and this may be idealistic, but if I had a good friend and I was screwing off royally, I'd like for them to tell me. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to have a a concept of what we are about and what we're trying to accomplish here. We're not a catch fall for everybody. Some people don't belong here yet. And I think it's kind 
for us to for them to get those experience necessary for them to truly be able to take advantage of this I think that's what the people in Kentucky want I think that's what parents want and I think down deep that's what students want mm -hmm. how many not yet students have you actually well I don't know if these are all not yet so I do know that we've had about 17 asked not to come back to the residence halls but that wow. was for a variety of issues and the only reason I know that is somebody made a report to me but some of them were probably not yet others just may have done foolish things that it, they knew they shouldn't have. If a student has a problem with certain um, teachers on campus or residence halls, advisors, any academic leader on campus, can they come to you with their problems or do you Well, they can, but I don't people? know if I can solve their problem. Right. I mean, if you had a problem with the professor, what would you do? Well, I go to the professor probably. That's, that's, the, <laughs> you know, that's the most logical thing to do. Mm -hmm. If you have a communication problem, you're not getting along, there's a perceptual issue, I think people should take, it, take advantage and not be shy, shy, be assertive, and go to the source. If the source is between you and the professor, that's the easiest way and the best way to solve it. If it can't get solved there, then there are other mechanisms, the deans, vice presidents, and, and the president. Oh, I'll listen to a student, but when they come to me, they should realize, if they're screwing off, they're not going to fool me. Okay. I'm going to say, grow up. I mean, you know, hey, you have been in class in three days. Why mm -hmm. would this person think you're wonderful? <laughs> Let's go to a commercial right now. Can we talk about that when we get back? We can talk about it anytime you want. <laughs> we'll be right back after these messages. Uh, that's Jenny. But that's not Jenny's dad. If she gets into that car, you may be looking at Jenny for the last time. I'm McGruff, the crime dog. Let me show you something. See that playground? A lot of kids there. Every day in this country, 60 kids disappear. Some run away, but a lot are kidnapped by strangers or even by people they know. Almost 20,000 kids a year. 20,000 kids, one kid at a time. Maybe your kid, on your street, just like Jenny. You know, your kids can learn to protect themselves against crime at home, at school, on the street. Hey, nice going, Jenny. She's gonna tell her folks about this. And you can write to McGruff. Learn how to keep your family and your community safe and help uh, take a bite out of crime. Hi, and welcome back. We're here with Dr. Eaglin, the president of Moorhead State University, and we're talking about being the president of Moorhead State University. As a new president, people are going to be curious, especially the students, and they will tend to talk. and. Unfortunately, that seems to start rumors. I've heard, as a student, I've heard some of the rumors on campus, and I was wondering if we could talk about those, and if you'd like to talk about those. Well, which ones have you heard about? Well, I heard about a hats rule that you had started, and I was, <laughs> in talking with you earlier, I found it to be very interesting and way off from what I heard. Well, I let me tell you the story so that you have it right, and we'll Good. set it right to whomever's watching. Uh, I like to speak to freshmen. I love doing it where I was before. I met with every freshman English class. Well, that's impossible here. So we had all the freshmen or new students come to one place in the beginning of school. What I like to talk about is, you know, what does it mean to be a college student? It means taking responsibility for your own behavior and hopefully in a positive way so you can be successful. Everybody wants them to be successful. They're teachers. They, I mean, the whole institution should be there for success, not for failure. Mm -hmm. And I usually give a little spiel about that. And I also, in that spiel, say that it's good for people to know what's expected of them. And I'm telling you what I expect of you because if you listen to what I say, you can be successful. And here are the things I expect. Well, I got in there that day, and I looked out at 1,200 people, and there were about 200 young men wearing baseball caps <laughs> and sitting there like this. Now, I, you know, I don't have nothing against baseball caps, but... I basically said, this is an academic building that's been here a long time. Uh, this is an academic institution, and, and we want you to be successful. But I do know that wearing a hat inside is not the right thing to do. Well, it was dead silence. I mean, ugh, I mean who's this ogre up there? I mean, but the <laughs> hats came off, in most cases. Well, that, that has, was a kind of a symbol that has kind of moved through the whole campus. Uh, you said policy. Uh, 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 rule, and some have said policy. I've set no policy. 
The reason I said that is that's just one little factor that people should learn that there's a way to dress for certain things. There's a time to wear a hat. There's a time not to wear a hat. There's a time to talk. There's a time not to talk. There's a time to listen. And all of these factors one learns. And if you're going to be successful in this world, you should have some general understanding of what's acceptable and what's not. Mm -hmm. Most adults who look out and see younger people wear, wear hats, look like they're disinterested, form an opinion. And that opinion could be a negative factor. And if no one ever challenges that in a young person, how do they learn? And so I didn't say it to be an ogre. I didn't say, I said it to be helpful. And I did later on say why I said it. Well, uh, obviously some of the faculty agreed with me and they said, you know, you should and we should say those sorts of things. So as I understand it, some professors have said hats off in mm -hmm. the class. And I said, well, hats off, shape up. I mean, if that's what it, needs, if that what it takes, mm -hmm. do it. It's no big deal. We're not depriving you of any right. We're trying to help you become successful. It makes sense now that you hear it from your point of view. And, Rather uh, than on and, campus. You know, and, and I've had, well, I've had people on our maintenance staff, can I wear my hat when I work? <laughs> well, sure you can. <laughs> I mean, but if you come into my office to ask me something, you should take that hat off. But if you're in your workplace and you're doing things and things are going to fall on your head and this, that, and the other, wear your hat. You're going to walk up and down. But you come into my office or anybody else's office or in a classroom, take it off. It's just good sense. Another thing. Um, that I think the students don't understand, and after talking to you, it's a completely different story, was that you didn't want to live in the presidential house <laughs> on Morehead State's campus. Well, I'll, very quickly, I'm asthmatic. I have a lot of problems with allergy. This seems to be the allergy capital of the world. Yes. In the times that I visited, I actually had some difficulties, and it was something I had to think about before I took the job. Well, the president's home is a very nice home. It's really a house. A lot of people have lived there, but there's a carpet that's been in there, I'd say, 30 years. Well, carpets, you know, they get smells. There had been dogs in there. There had been cats in there before. <laughs> and I had trouble breathing in some of the areas. So I basically said that, well, we're not going to remove all this carpet. It costs too much money. But in the bedroom where my wife and I spend, you know, there in a little room off to the side, we're kind of cubby-holed in that big old building in one little part, we had the carpet taken out. And that helps me because where I sleep, and there's nice hardwood floor under it. it. didn't hardly cost any money. They just redid the floor. Where I sleep, if I'm at least in that environment over a period of time, it's just, you know, an eight or a nine hour period of time that I'm not having difficulty breathing. And in that I'm very seldom around the house any other time because I'm out doing various things like interviews and the other, uh, then uh, at least it would lower the, the potential that I would have a health problem. And mm -hmm. I don't think you want to have a president who has a health no, problem. No, I don't. I well, want you, you want You fit. want me energetic, you <laughs> want me fit, you want me to do the things that are important. Makes and that's what that's now. all about. And I wasn't going to move out of the house. Or anything <laughs> like that. You said that you consider the house a house and not a home. Well, it is. Uh, I mean, I have four children. Uh, could you imagine growing up in that? No, I can't. <laughs> okay. that, then my answer, you have the answer to the question. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back with Dr. Eaglin after these messages. Thank you. And Hi, and welcome back to Modern Images. We're here with Dr. Eaglin, the president of Moorhead State. I understand that you recently read an, a newspaper article written by a student about the new drinking law in Kentucky. I don't know if it was written by a student, but oh, there, were many, okay. there were many students quoted in it. And, and what caught my eye is, as you know, uh, I don't think it's a law, but there's been some interpretation that uh, young people under the age of 21 could not go into a bar unless there was 35% of the sales food. were food. food. Well, that, yes. you know, that probably hits virtually every young person here in 
in Moorhead, because uh, most of our students are under 21. And I thought to myself, well, you know, if, if, you know, if this is where they go, and that's been cut out, then what is it to take its place? And so I started working. I'd had 15 real, really minority students come into my home, and they were talking about some of the difficulties of being a minority here, and, and uh, many of them stay the weekends, and uh, they can't afford to go home. And we were just kind of knocking ideas back and forth about what we could do, and, and that article struck my mind, and they said that uh, they really have nowhere to go on Thursday nights. You know, fraternities do this. A lot of them went to bars and this and the other. So I said, well, why don't we start something on the campus? And we have. Well, we have now a minority organization, and I think we've kind of moved in, into the residence halls and various floors or various buildings are co-sponsoring things on uh, Thursday nights for our students. Uh, I think they had 75 the first time and 85 the next time, and I think the third one is this, and it's going to be in the Krager room. But uh, also, students were saying, well, we have nowhere to hang around. I mean, there's, we go stand in front of cart mail, people get mad at us because it makes too much noise, and mm -hmm. the police come by, and are they spying? I mean, all, all the suspicion. And I said, well, let's try to find a place where students can go. They can get a cup of coffee or eat a pizza or whatever they want, so we're going to keep the grill room over in Alumni Tower open. Times and you know, it's, I want there to be safe places for people to go. I want us to be reasonable about that, and 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 you know, just, so I asked student government to be a partner in this, and they were more than willing. And I've asked the student organizations to kind of be involved, and 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 it's a safe place to go on Thursday nights and places to hang around during the week, and I think that's healthy. What are some of the other programs or th ideas that you have for the upcoming years to? keep relations good between yourself and the students? Well, one of the things I did right away is that I've created several advisory committees to me. Uh, administratively, I've opened up, uh, instead of it being all vice presidents and the president making decisions over in this dark corner and mm -hmm. sending out all their, 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 their uh, edicts, that I've tried to build the faculty and the staff and students into a kind of a general advisory committee to me. But I also have a specific advisory committee which is comprised of students. As a matter of fact, I just met with them last week, and they had questions about oh, mature students' scholarships. They had questions about this rally in, in Lexington, uh, I mean, Frankfurt. Uh, they've had, you know, where's the money uh, go that from student activities funds? And, and, you know, I sit there, I listen, I try to, if they want information, I try to give them the right information. If they want me to be involved in something, I can either say yes or no and say why. Uh, I've met with Trailblazer editor, it's an open door. He can come in. Uh, his reporters can come in anytime mm -hmm. they would like. Uh, I've volunteered to come on here anytime there's any kind of something brewing out there. People want to know where I stand. I'm not shy about saying where I stand and, and justifying where I am on things, mm -hmm. but I try to get, you know, input, impact, input, and uh, advice from all these groups. I also have a faculty advisory group. I have a staff advisory group have an expanded council which has about 60 people in it more for communications Goodness. but you know if you don't get out as I say if you don't get out amongst them how do you ever know right. you can't be a college president in your office and you can't not listen as a matter of fact the best advice I give to people who want to be administrators is to say you know open with your ear not your mouth you had mentioned earlier about talking with student government association and, and making something on Thursday nights to do. What other mm -hmm. things do you do with the Student Government Association? Well, not much yet because I haven't really, I mean, obviously I'll do anything they ask me to mm -hmm. ceremonially and I, do, and I do a lot of that. Um, I have taken upon myself to meet with certain student groups that I thought were important. I met with all the RAs, for example, who are primarily students to talk about my philosophy and the not yet and, and all this, that and the other. Uh, the minority group, I've, I've spent a lot of time with uh, the head of minority affairs and have tried to do things to help blacks feel more uh, a part of this institution. Um, but uh, other than that, at this point in time, I haven't been asked to do much uh, else, with but I'm here. <laughs> do you work with the student students at the, in the dorms directly, like with the resident advisors or the dorm directors as you would just Well, said? you know, initially I did. I mean, I don't work with them. I, I think they needed to meet me, know what my philosophy is, how I see the world. Uh, 
interact with them in those ways. I've gone to a few 101 classes, mm -hmm. uh, and I've gone went to a graduate class last night of students. But no, I, you know, we have staff there, and uh, so I, I haven't intruded into the right. normal staff situation. But I, you know, I'm interested. Uh, I'm around students an awful lot. Mm -hmm. I, I eat in the student center a okay. lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be right back after these messages with Dr. Eaglin. Every year, half a million women in the world's poorest countries die because of complications from getting pregnant too soon, too often, or too many times. 500 million women want and need family planning, but can't get the information or the means. This in a world that can't adequately feed the people it has. A world that will double its population during the next 40 years. Surely a woman's most fundamental right is not to be trapped in an endless cycle of pregnancy and birth that endangers her health and that of her children and ruins any hope for a better life. By helping women control the size of their families, we help them control their own lives. And we slow down the runaway population growth that threatens us all. The Population Institute is working to make solving the population crisis an international priority. To learn how you can help, write the Population Institute, 110 Maryland Avenue, Northeast, Washington, D.C., 20002. Hi, and we're back with President Eaglin. Is there anything in closing that you would like to say to the students or to the university at all? This place can be as great as people allow it to be. Be involved. That's what I say. Be involved. Know how to get things done. Be willing to take risk. Take risk. Take risk. And this place can be as good as you want it to be, but it takes involvement. That's and that's faculty, staff, and students. That's great. Thank you very much for coming on the show, and I wish you luck in the upcoming term that you have. Thank you, and we'll... Thank you. Good.